Hello, everyone, and welcome to How to Chess. We are joined by a legendary trainer, player, author, and chessable author. He's been a top 15 player in the world who's beaten the last four world champions, national champion of both his native Yugoslavia. He's from Bosnia and his residence, the Netherlands. He's transitioned to working primarily as a high-level trainer. He's had great success. He trained the Iranian team for years, working with GMs like Max Hudalu and a young Ali Reza Farouja. And this year, of course, he was the trainer of the gold, win gold medal winning Uzbek Olympiad team. He's also a renowned author and soon to release his fourth chessable course, End Games Expertise, Rook End Games by GM Ivan Sokolov, our guest, and GM Efstasios Grivas. And I am excited to welcome him to the show and honored, I might add, welcome GM Sokolov. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm very happy for you having me. Yeah, I'm ex so excited to talk with you. I've been a fan of your games and uh, your work for so long. Um, so the theme of this th season of chess interviews, of chess podcasts, uh, Yvonne, is chess role models. Um, what comes to mind when I ask you about chess role models? Uh, I guess that it has to do with the generation somebody lived in and how the person developed as a chess player. So actually, my whole generation, we were kind of, uh, obviously, we were influenced a lot uh, by Kaspar, myself and some other players. Why? Because uh, he was not that much older. He was only like four or five years older than the rest of us. Uh, had a very dynamic style and, uh, well, people were captivated by his style because uh, you know, you have to understand that at that time we did not have, let's say, engines. Uh, so, and a whole, whole opening preparation was at a different level. So, having somebody very young uh, coming in a progressive, progressing in a kind of uh, incredibly quick way to become a world champion, and uh, all of us being captivated by this uh, dynamic style because. Uh, uh, nowadays, when somebody is done with the game, let's say, uh, well, even during the game, you know the truth. You don't know who is going to win, but you know the truth about the position. At the time when I was uh, growing up, just to give you an idea, let's say I was uh, at some moment the commentator of uh, one of the world championship matches between Kar Karpov and Kasparov. So they would play a match and okay, then I will get by Telex, uh, I would get the moves. And I will have to analyze it so that the next morning in a daily paper, my comments are going to be published. Uh, of course, in this limited time, without uh, computers, it was not easy to deliver those analyses. But let's forget about me. You have a situation that uh, for a long time, uh, top players were arguing for a days about some kind of positions and the verdict. Uh, was some sacrifice right or was it wrong? It was, there was something like an uh, ultimate truth because, okay, I, I think it is safe to say that uh, any of those top engines, if they kind of drop to like depth 50, they give you ultimate truth. Uh, whether you are going to find this truth uh, on your own, it is a different story, but you know what is going on. In our time, it was quite, uh, quite different. And so we were all kind of captivated by this uh, by this kind of a play next to the kind of play also sort of uh, okay not exactly you know fisher like situation one against everybody else but uh, it was perceived that uh, let's say carpa was a representative of the system and that kaspara was not representative of the system not exactly fighting alone like fisher because he had a powerful team of uh, very strong seconds and trainers, but still not exactly being in the same position uh, like Karpov. And this obviously captivated, uh, you know, young people in development, people from my uh, generation. So, and of course, he was famed for his uh, obviously legendary uh, tactical acumen, his opening preparation as well. Um, and as you say, he did have uh, people helping him with that. Was there a particular aspect, Ivan, that you guys centered on as you tried to sort of um, emulate what he was doing? Uh, yes. First of all, uh, well, you don't have it maybe today. Because let's say uh, Magnus Carlsen is not exactly a person who is uh, 
focused on getting advantage out of the opening. And he changes many lines just in order to get a playable position where he believes that he will outplay his opponent because he's a better player. But uh, before him, opening theory was dictated by a world champion or a world championship matches. And uh, the lines which, for example, uh, Queen Cindy and Petrosian variation, this A3 line, okay, it is called Petrosian variation, but person that really brought it into, let's say, limelight uh, was a Kasparov. When he was at some stage in the 80s, early 80s, winning one game or, or, or the other, and, and after the other, and most of those games getting some very strong, you know, attack with his poor majority in the center, uh, obviously everybody was analyzing those kind of positions and trying to replicate uh, those ideas or build up on those ideas uh, uh, in order to achieve a, a good result. So, or King Sindian was, let's say, uh, opening, which uh, I think almost every young player, when he starts, he must have played King, King Sindian once in the lifetime. But uh, by the time El Kaspara was developing, it gave certainly new, you know, influx into King Sindian, because by that time, Tal has stopped playing it a long time ago. And... Uh, Suddenly, some very young player coming and playing King Cynthia and winning with the black in great attacks, one game after the other. Mm. Of course, it inspired. Makes sense. And of course, you had many time, many opportunities to play him uh, over your career. Of course, one of your most famous wins uh, was against uh, Kasparov. So as you sort of elevate to that level where he is a peer of yours, um, was it intimidating? No, he wasn't. It wasn't. But I think that uh, he changed his uh, style over the years because uh, at some stage he wanted to win game at home. Uh, while uh, in the maybe also this is because in the eighties it was difficult to win game at home. You could come very well prepared, but you still did not have the tools, even with having the best seconds to exactly, you know, work out uh, lines to its uh, perfection. This is something which appear, uh, appeared later on. But I did notice with uh, uh, Kasparov and also with the Kramnik that at some moment uh, they wanted to actually win game at home. More or less when opening is, uh, well, analyses are finished, that position is sort of crystal clear, like what is going on. So this is what I saw as a difference and so let's say, well, change in approach. How much did it influence me? It didn't influence me very much because uh, uh, I was actually always, uh, to be frank, uh, too lazy to be willing to invest <laughs> enough time in this very hard, you know, opening work with the computers in order to really come up to the ultimate truth of some certain variations. Yeah, and you mentioned um, in an old interview with Sagar Shah where you you did discuss sort of um, your your games against Kasparov that that you didn't feel fear, like especially in in that famous Nimzo Indian win. Um, so you say you were too lazy to prepare. You'd been sort of you and your peers had been looking up to Kasparov for for years. So why do you think it was that you still, when you sit down to play him, you know he's legendary Kasparov for many things, but for one thing, for sort of his his board presence um, and the fierce energy he brought to the board. So why do you think that didn't bother you, Ivan? Uh, well, first, actually, I felt that uh, I had that uh, on a second move that I have a small psychological advantage when game just started. Because at that time, he was playing uh, Grunfeld almost only. In like 90% of his uh, games, he was playing Grunfeld. Uh, uh, to tell you the truth, I mean, I had, of course, some idea about line which I wanted to play, but uh, there was no way that my preparation in Grunfeld would be anything close to, to his preparation. And when I saw second movie six, I thought, okay, looks like that uh, something is bothering him. So this is a good sign. 
let's see how this continues, but this is a good sign. So then I thought, okay, if uh, there is something which is psychologically bothering him so that uh, he decided for some reason, the guy decided not to play in Grunfeld and he played it, I don't know how many games versus Karpov in this World Championship match and some other people who are better players than me. So, well, if something is bothering him psychologically not to do it, okay, let's be bold. Hmm. And it uh, it paid off. It sure did. And you told a story again in this interview. I just, I'd love to hear it firsthand. Uh, the the moment uh, before Kasparov resigned, you knew you were winning this game. Um, what happened then? <laughs> well, I was not actually in a hurry to to, let's say, uh, make a move, because first I was, because it was so obvious, and uh, also body language was very clear, you know. Uh, well, Rolex was back on, chocolate was uh, in a jacket, jacket was on, but then I thought, but wait, okay, where am I going next time to have this situation in my life? <laughs> Maybe never. And uh, there was plenty of time, and I decided it's okay to just, uh, you know, enjoyed for a for a while and uh, maybe i enjoyed it a little bit maybe too long but okay and at some stage uh yeah i won the game and this was uh, uh but you know it is interesting that a lot of people ask me about uh, uh this particular game but let's say uh i i would say that my uh win versus uh anant in a white and in a tata stilo versus kramnik were much better games Mm -hmm. uh, but for some reason, uh, everybody keeps on coming back to this, uh, you know, one single game. Or my win in Vikanze, Tata Steel versus Topala was also a better game. But uh, probably because, okay, it was at uh, that time, the, I think Kasparo was having seven and a half out of eight when the game was right. played. He was having some sort of absolutely bizarre score. That, uh, yes, this sort of uh, one single game, let's say, uh, Divine, uh, defined or cemented my chess uh, uh, situation so that I had many kind of interviews with the people I did win some very strong events but a uh, few tournaments in Iceland like Selfos it was a super tournament tournament in Sarajevo I won alone it was a super tournament a uh, couple of national championships uh, nobody is asking me about those tournaments wins <laughs> but somehow it, you know, sticks to uh, one single game. But okay, I guess this is uh, uh, how it is also in some other sports, that something is more uh, memorable to other people than something else. Yeah, and I think part of it is that sort of aura of, as you say, that particular tournament. But generally, even as as a, a fantastic as these other world champions and uh, were, um, there's this aura of invincibility about Kasparov at the time that I think might contribute to it. Uh, yes, I think so. I think that he probably was also, uh, from time this time distance, you know, when he decided to quit in 2005, we were all a little bit, you know, baffled because he decided to quit the moment that he uh, won Linares with a round to spare. Because he lost last round to Topalov, and he still won the tournament. When he announced that, okay, he's going to quit. But uh, from this time, distance, and all this young generation of players coming, and, uh, you know, just changing, and people getting equally good preparation, uh, probably he saw this, uh, this coming, and from this time, distance, it is sort of... Uh, it becomes more understandable his decision to quit uh, at a still reasonably young age and being rated the world number one. Yeah. Um, well, Ivan, it's fantastic to hear these stories of all the, the legends you've played, but let's let's transition to, uh, obviously you still play on occasion, but you're primarily now maybe in the role of role model and you've gotten to work with uh, some of the brightest young talents in the world um, with great success. Uh, how do you view that role? What what do you um, what do you try to do for players like uh, Faruja and Abdusatarov and Sindarov uh, as you work as you've worked with them? Uh, yes, I am in a let's say a fortunate position 
to be able to work with the world's uh, best uh, young players. But okay, it is somehow, you know, goes together because uh, uh, first I, I achieved uh, results and then I got the possibility to work with all of them, not uh, the other way around. Uh, so when I actually, in 2013, I decided to quit my playing career and to kind of switch to uh, a coaching career. And this was maybe the uh, most difficult decision I ever made in my life. Uh, why? Because it is not easy when you kind of completely change the job, because it is a different profession. You may say you are inside the chess, you are inside chess, but you are in a, from a different angle inside the chess. It is just a different profession. And uh, in general, what people have a problem with is not understand, not like understanding, okay, I have to change, I have to do something different. But getting yourself out of a comfort zone that you have been in for like 25 years and start doing something different was not easy. Uh, I did this, and I'm happy that I have done it. Uh, working with uh, all those players, it is what they have in common, of course, is a uh, abundance of talent. So now I have started to work in a Romanian chess federation since the uh, 1st of January uh, this year. It is my steady job. And I worked there together with Bogdan Deak and Kirill Shevchenko, also two very talented uh, young players and also very high rated. Uh, so I find this, you know, work very interesting and I find this work very, very challenging. But it is a different kind of job. What I try to do, I try to bring to them a something new when it comes to insights, when it comes to knowledge, when it comes to angle, because chess develops. I, of course, I monitor those kind of developments and I monitor these kind of new ideas. And I try to analyze them and to try to figure it out what would ap appeal to this particular player and what are maybe areas to work on. I do not work with them on the openings. Uh, why? Because nowadays opening work is... Uh, like uh, going into cloud and letting engine run on some crazy depth. And I basically tell them, look, guys, uh, I was never doing this for myself. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to do it for you either. Also, because I don't like this kind of work. But there are different areas that I that I can help. And this uh, seems like I have been doing it reasonably well. It, it sure does. Um, so how much of your work is focused on sort of the psychological side as opposed to as you say, you you might give them some positions and help uh, help evaluate sort of things that they can work on. But are you giving like psychological OTB advice as well? Yes, yes, it is because uh, uh, this is you know one advantage which you have if you played top events. Because look, you have different kind of coaches, coaches that uh, did play top events yourself themselves and the top players themselves. And coaches were maybe also good coaches, but they have never played in such a kind of events themselves or played those kind of very top players themselves. Uh, okay, I think that in this area, I have an edge uh, because uh, I know how was it to kind of be there. Now, you know, we can start to argue on a different kind of area like uh, uh, is Zina, is. Zidane better coach than Mourinho because he knew what was it to kind of stand there and to maybe shoot a penalty that is deciding everything. Classic argument of, in sports. Yeah. Yes, a lot of people would say it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think that it does. Mm -hmm. I'm allowed to be wrong. Just like many other people are, you know, are allowed to be wrong in this assumption. But I think that there is a one perception if you have been standing there your, yourself and completely different perception if you think that you have figured out how would have had been if you had been there yourself. And this is, uh, I think, advantage which I have, and I can understand players better. I can understand better mistakes done, the pressure they are under, and, well, how to kind of improve dealing with this pressure. This is, I think... Uh, a reasonable advantage which I have in my work that uh, I have experienced those kind of uh, uh, situations myself. 
It makes sense. I'm I'm certainly not not in a position to argue with you. And obviously, intuitively, especially with chess, it makes sense to me. I mean, the the playing at the top level is just an entirely uh, different thing. Now, let me follow up a little bit on your working with the Romanian team. Um, as as far as I know, it hasn't been that widely publicized yet. Um, number one, I'm curious. You mentioned uh, Kirill Shevchenko uh, and Bogdan Diak, and they've got some other talented players. But uh, Richard Rapport is also going to be playing for them. Do you know if you'll be working with him? Uh, well, maybe, but he has a, at this moment a uh, private trainer assigned to him. I do not want to talk uh, who. If Richard Rapport wants to talk himself, it is his business. Uh, so let's keep it, let's say, professional secrecy. Uh, it may happen in the future. I don't know. Look, situation is that I'm working with Bogdan Deak already for two years. Okay. So this is just a, a continuation that is now going to be more often. Okay. And there are other members of a team like, the, okay, Kirill Shevchenko became Romanian national team member about, I think, uh, one month ago or or even less, maybe two weeks ago. And I, for the first time, I've started to work with him now when I was in Bucharest uh, uh, last month. And so, And there are a couple of other national players there that I'm going to be working together too. Okay. And obviously, your success with Uzbekistan was well publicized. It seems like it was quite the roller coaster ride in the wake of winning the national championship. It's been reported that there were bonuses given and uh, big ceremonies. Um, do you do you know, will you be continuing any work with the Uzbek team? Are you able to discuss that? Uh, yes, I'm able to discuss this. Uh, look, uh, uh, the nature of a contract with the Romanian Chess Federation does not uh, permit me to uh, coach other national teams. Okay. So this is quite, uh, let's say, clear. Okay. And this is the nation. So as long as I'm employed here, I would not be coaching any other national teams. We have quite clearly, let's say, emphasized what am I allowed to do and what I'm not allowed to do. And uh, so, unfortunately, at something like Asian Games or something like this on, or on Olympia, I cannot say, okay, now I'm going to suddenly coach uh, uh, Uzbekistan, not as long as I'm employed by uh, Romanian Chess Federation. Okay, well, congratulations on uh, on the new role. <laughs> I'm sure you will have uh, even... Sorry, go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Well, for me, it is also, you know, it is uh, also part of a, part of a challenge uh, because uh, uh, with Uzbekistan team, I obviously did not expect that within a two months' time, uh, we will win the Olympiad, and then on the world teams, that he, we will win silver. Mm -hmm. It happened in a two months' time, even with the fact by the fact that by the world teams, uh, Abdul Satarov did not play. Uh, so, with that team, I have uh, won everything which was there to win. And now, for me, it is a new challenge to kind of try to figure out whether it is possible to do it with a completely different team. It'll be fun to watch. Um, and yeah, I mean, with the resources being invested in Romania and the talent of the players, uh, I wouldn't want to bet against them. But Ivan, let's talk about uh, why we're here, which is, of course, you've got another chessable course forth forthcoming, um, which may be out by the time this interview comes out, by the way. Um, and I know you're working on some other content as well. Uh, but let's start with the chessable course. What was the vision behind uh, your Rook Endgame course? Uh, well, the vision was that at some moment when you are working on as a coach, well, 10 years, you have a lot of, uh, let's say, unpublished materials. And I have never written an Endgame book. My work was uh, mostly middle games and some openings. I never wrote an endgame book, but I obviously had a lot of material. And then I was talking to my friend of Stratius Grivas, uh, who had even uh, more material. And then he said something like, okay, uh, you know, if uh, uh, I'm willing to combine all this material and systemize this material, and I send it to you, and you're okay. Would you be maybe ready to record it in a 
quite accessible. And I said, okay, this is more or less how it came, uh, how it uh, came around. And I had also the re- second reason is uh, that I had very good experience with accessible. Let's say uh, they are extremely transparent when he comes to professional relationship. Uh, you get your updated sale information on hourly basis. And you get paid on monthly basis. And uh, I have never worked with actually any other, let's say, entity that has been then so transparent as a uh, accessible. And uh, it helps, obviously. Yeah. And uh, at least to say uh, Barcelona is not the worst place to go to record. <laughs> yeah, well said. Yeah, beautiful city. Um, and who did you have a certain audience in mind for this course in particular? Is it for master level players, for players of all levels? Uh, I would say for players of all levels, though definitely for the players of a very high level, they will benefit from this. Why? Because on a number of those examples, I did uh, test uh, some members of uh, Uzbekistan team, and I did test some members of uh, Romanian team, so very strong players, and some examples were known to them, some completely not. So even they benefited from this course. Would it be too difficult for a lower-rated players? I hope not. Look, uh, I did b- my best to explain it in a, a video. And also, we tried to explain it also in a written form uh, to the best we could. And also, nowadays, uh, you know, weaker players, they have a one considerable advantage compared to some time ago when they were analyzing some positions. If my explanation in a video doesn't help, verbal explanation doesn't help, and they can never figure it out, well, there is a help, you know, it is called uh, Stockfish or Layla. <laughs> And this uh, help they can always uh, use as an ultimate uh, tool to ask a question if there is something which uh, we forgot to explain. But uh, the whole course is uh, systematically based on some positions, on connecting the uh, past and the future. So let's say studies made by André Sharon from 19, I think, he, uh, 1920, 1923. And then some modern games uh, were actually exactly the same positions uh, were coming. And sometimes uh, players playing it right, sometimes very strong players playing it wrong. And uh, so it is an uh, I- idea to improve, first of all, players' knowledge about uh, endings and to improve uh, their results. So it is, let's say, a practical guide. It is practical guide and aimed at improvement. Okay, sounds great. Uh, look forward to checking that out. And Ivan, this has been fantastic. I did just, before we go, if you're up for it, try to get a bit of uh, chess improvement advice. Um, of course, you've written some, um, written and created some uh, wonderful content, often sort of relating to structures. Um, Magnus Carlsen's, um, and sorry, middle game evolution, I'm a big fan of. And you've got winning chess middle games. Uh, on Chessable. And I found, uh, again, in the interview with Sagar Shah, you had a great quote that I thought maybe uh, those of us working on our games might uh, learn from hearing you elaborate on. So here's the quote. You said, I think if you're an amateur and you want to improve your game, understanding pawn structure is very important because then you have a grip on something, something on which you can build your knowledge later. Um, So obviously, your, your books and courses are a good place to start. How else would you recommend studying structures? Well, I'm now actually, as we as we speak, uh, I am busy writing winning chess middle games, uh, first move e4, something which will be published by uh, New in Chess later in the year. I have already written a first chapter, and I'm about to finish a second chapter. Uh, it differs a bit compared to, let's say, d4 systems because you have much more of the structures. So let's put it this way, how to explain it. Uh, if I'm talking uh, double pawns in a D4 systems, it is 
90% of this material is going to come from incendium. And if you are talking double pulse in a E4 system, you could be having Rouser variation. You could be having French Vinaver. Uh, and, okay, Rouser variation, Sicilian and French Vinaver do not relate to each other uh, in any sort of way. So there is going to be, it will be more diverse. Maybe it will be less focused on one particular position, but it will be more diverse. And I hope to help people, you know, improve this. But uh, well, what pawn structures help you about, and this kind of knowledge, it is a pattern recognition. So when I say you have something to hold on to, if you have this kind of knowledge, when you see some middle game position, okay, your brain is automatically trying to draw some conclusion based on your knowledge and pattern recognition. Okay, this is supposed to be a plan. This is supposed to maybe to be good for me. Now let's try to calculate to work it out. Because if you have this kind of, uh, let's say, knowledge, then your calculation is a support tool to your pattern recognition and to your knowledge. If you do not have this knowledge, then your calculation is your maybe only tool to try to figure out what is going on in, in the position, which A, makes it much harder, and B, obviously you are going to commit much more mistakes because you're a human, you're not computer. So in your calculation, you're going to blunder something here and there. So this idea of... Uh, having good understanding of a pawn structure and the basics plan, and then applying this at the pattern recognition knowledge and using your calculation as a support tool is, I think, going to bring uh, better results. Fantastic advice. So to build that muscle, obviously, look forward to the new New in Chess book. Um, do you recommend playing through games in the opening? Um, are there any other particular resources you would recommend? Uh, well, let's say to club players, uh, or okay, to most of the players, but this takes a little bit of work. I do recommend when you like some kind of, let's say, variation, and that you know that you are going to get some certain middle games position for sure. And this is not, let's say, something which is computerized. So we are not talking, let's say, neither of poison pawn. We are talking some kind of normal positions, normal limb three, the other maybe queen's queen's gambit, Kalsba structure, or something like this. That you then try to search through your database the games of uh, best players who basically played it, and then to build your own, let's say, work database, and then try to explore further on this, trying to understand what did they write, do right, and what did they do wrong. Uh, it is, of course, a time-consuming process. Definitely time-consuming process. So it is, let's say, easier to, for somebody, let's say, who wants to study uh, double pawn structure in a browser and dynamics of it, uh, it is much less time-consuming, let's say, to buy my coming uh, winning chess middle games fun E4 book, because I was just this, this morning working on this chapter. <laughs> but... Uh, on the other hand, if you really want to excel, it makes sense to take a one step further, which is more time consuming, energy consuming, but uh, it will pay off. Okay. Excellent advice. And my last question for you, Yvonne, this has been fantastic. Um, you were the youngest GM in the world when you became GM at 19, which it's crazy in light of the modern context of so many um, baby GMs, yes. but I'm curious, uh, in your own development, um, what, uh, what was your approach as a kid? Were you doing lots of tactics or were you, prim were you working, were you working with trainers, um, uh, or was it primarily through playing and analysis? What, what would you say was the biggest contributor to your, uh, huge success from a young age? Uh, analyzing games, uh, I was never doing a tactics book. Tactics or a puzzle, kind of sit and kind of try to solve, I don't know, 50 for a breakfast because it is very good. I was ne never doing this. Not a single day of my life. Wow. Uh, information, look, you have to take into perspective that information was much less available. 
much less available. So my tools were, uh, Botvinnik did publish at some stage uh, three books about uh, his uh, games, and he analyzed them, them deeply. It was published in Russian language. My Russian language is not perfect to talk about politics, but it is a very good to understand chess book. Okay. Uh, there was a book, uh, Selective Games of Keras, which was very useful. It was written in German. Uh, there was a book of Tal, uh, written by Tal and Damsky, Tal Selective Games. Uh, which I actually had a difficulty with. I never managed to understand Tal because this chaotic play uh, uh, never really... I could uh, always happily sacrifice a pawn or a two, maybe exchange, uh, so-called the minor sacrifice, but to be hysterically dropping pieces all, all, <laughs> all over the board, uh, uh, I could not really you know, grasp it. And there is very few players who, who could, I mean... Uh, Magnus Carlsen cannot play such a kind of a chess either. Okay, Shirov can play such a such a kind of chess, but there are very few players who could do it. Uh, uh, of course, there was this book uh, of Fischer, my sixty uh, memorable games, which all of us we you know went through. There was famous book of Bronstein about candidates tournament. This is something which also we all went through. Uh, there was. Uh, at that time, okay, book of uh, young Kasparov, he selected games, which was called something like The Time Will Tell. Yeah, classic. Uh, a classic. So, okay, that was about it. And there was one book of Alekhine written by Kotov. I think uh, his best games, maybe 300 games or something like this. So it was not like that we had, to, there were maybe, let's say, 10, 12 books available. It was not like that we had this abundance of uh, information. And I was going through those uh, uh, books, analyzing and then making my own, you know, notes, sometimes on a paper, sometimes in a book, which, of course, some of those notes were uh, completely wrong, because I did not have an uh, unbiased observer called uh, Leila or Stockfish to check it out, hmm. and to tell me whether I was wrong. But this was, let's say, the development. Amazing how things have changed. Yes. <laughs> Just incredible. Uh, well, Ivan, uh, this has been a true honor. It's been amazing to hear your stories and perspective about how much things have changed. So the forthcoming slash current chessable course is called Endgames Expertise, Rook Endgames. Um, and uh, we look forward to the the new in chess book as well. Um, anything to add before we we say our goodbyes? Uh, yes, if everything is good, I have my second uh part of a book on Magnus Carlsen uh, uh, middle game development. Uh, uh, idea is that I get the manuscript done by the end of the year. Excellent. Hopefully, hopefully before that and that uh, I have to see how do I manage to squeeze everything in, but uh, it is certainly idea to basically get it done to round off the project because uh, uh, in my book on Magnus there are many kind of elements that I did not touch and that somehow requires examination and uh, also he's active player he keeps on playing so new games uh, you know keep on uh, keep on coming and of course uh, always uh, you know entertaining chess playing chess until uh, maximum maybe now even easier for him since he decided not to care about world championship titles so he can <laughs> right. just uh, you know sit and enjoy chess yeah, yeah, not a bad life he has. <laughs> not a bad life he has, exactly. So thanks a lot, uh, uh, Ben, for ho uh, hosting me. My pleasure, it was, it true was honor. A pleasure. It was yeah. a pleasure coming here, and uh, I hope that uh, viewers are going to like this uh, this podcast. I suspect they will. Thank you very much, uh, Grandmaster Sokolov, and uh, good luck finishing up your many projects. I know you're a busy guy. So yes, thank you. It. Thanks okay. a lot. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.